Hi guys, usually you see me on TFB TV, but for this particular episode, uh, Bloke has generously offered to host my video on his channel. Thank you very much, Bloke. I really appreciate it. I initially made this video for TFB TV, but I got so much into the history of it, and I really strayed away from the small arms part of it, talking about the 1940, uh, the 1842 retreat from Kabul. Um, that it was just so much more appropriate to have it on a different channel talking about the pure history of that retreat and talking about the various problems that Elphinstone had and the various issues that the British had in the first Anglo-Afghan War. Um, anyways guys, I hope you enjoy this video and I'm very generous and very thankful for Bloke for being interested in putting this little bit of um, history on his channel. Today I want to talk about some of the effectiveness of the Afghan long rifle in the fight against the British in 1841 and 1842. Now, it's a little bit of a complicated topic and there's a lot to unpackage and uncover here, so we'll talk about that in a second as well. But before that, I really want to set the context for you, all right? So right now, I'm on top of a hill called uh, Topeya Wazir Akbar Khan, and that means essentially the hill of Wazir Akbar Khan. And this name is extremely important because Wazir Akbar Khan was the guy who actually is credited with being the leader of the revolt that defeated the British in 1841 and eventually 1842, um, forcing their retreat of Elphinstone's army. Um, it's important because this whole area is actually known as Wazir Akbar Khan as well, and this is the hill associated with it. There's some neat stuff about this hill. Today it's a popular pi picnic destination. There's a swimming pool on top of it in which the Taliban used to carry out executions in addition to this ginormous flag that was actually made in India um, and it actually mechanically raises, which is pretty cool. But so right now, let's set the stage, right, before we get into any of the history. So I'm going to step behind the camera for a second, and I'm going to show you some stuff that's very relevant and very important to the conversation here. Next here, first let me point some things out. So right about there where my handy dandy pen is, that is Masood's circle. To the right of that, in this area, and let me pan over to here, this is the current U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan right here. There's a big building that's right about there that's called the Marriott Hotel. And that's currently abandoned that the embassy got attacked from previously. But behind these big buildings is the current ISAF headquarters. Now, why this is extremely important to us at TFB TV is that the ISAF headquarters is actually where the British camps were in 1841. The almost to the exact location. This is fascinating because, you know, the irony of the current ISAF headquarters today being on the exact same location as the British camps is just too fascinating to not ignore. In, in addition, if we move over here, so do you remember that big hill I talked about before that had this super old wall on top of it? Well, this is it right here, and that's, you know, the old Shire Dorwaza. But at the base of that hill, with, which we move over to about here, at the base of that hill is the Bala Hissar, and that's what you're looking at right now. The Bala Hissar is important because this is where uh, the Afghan royalty actually lived back in the 1800s and 1700s. So these two, these two things focus into a lot of account. All right, so now that we've got sort of the stage and the location set around here, let's go back to 1841. Gen this guy named General Elphinstone has led the army of the Indus into Kabul, and it's an army of occupation for, most of, for all intents and purposes. This is part of the great game. We're not going to get too much into the politics here because we really want to talk about the effectiveness of the Jalal Anyways, but what leads up to that is that when Elphinstone was here, so Elphinstone was this, uh, he was a combat veteran at Waterloo. He led a regiment at Waterloo about 30 years prior. But at this point in his life, he was extremely sick and he is possibly the most incompetent military leader in the last 200 years. If you read about this, which I do encourage you to do so, in fact, there's three books I would highly encourage you to pick up about this period of time in Afghanistan. Um, the first being Lady Sal's Journal of the Disaster of the Army in Afghanistan. Um, the second being The Afghan Way of War, which is a very good book talking about from the Afghan side of things. And the third being a book called Return of a King, which talks about this whole area from a very historical perspective. But what it comes down to is the British, when they were here, the British literally made every single mistake that they could have. Every single thing that could have gone wrong for them did go wrong. For as an example, you know, talking with the culture and dealing with cultural sensitivities of being here, um, the Afghans were extremely offended that the British, you know, actually started marrying Afghan women and actually had started having babies here. They did not like that. They stopped paying the Afghan Khans after a while, and that's one of the things that really set off the insurgency. Um, in addition, one of the biggest things is that time and time again, 
the British thought they could bribe their way out of every problem. In fact, on the last day of the British retreat to Jalalabad, literally the last morning, uh, the la the, when 100 troops from the 44th foot were massacred on top of a hill called Gandamak, um, that morning they sent out an officer to try to pay for safe passage to Jalalabad. And just the British did not understand that the Afghans didn't want their money. They wanted them dead and out of the country. And they just failed and failed again to reach a compromise and reach a deal. And even when they did, they thought they did, they would get ambushed behind. And uh, Akbar Khan's forces would come in and get them from behind as well. So talking about that awful retreat and the, effect the effectiveness of the Afghan long rifle. So first of all, the common, you know, the common thought process behind here of the historical perspective of what happened on that retreat was that the British troops were going through the hills and they were massacred from the hills because the Afghan sharpshooters were able to, you know, pick them off in mass from the hilltops and behind rocks and stuff like that, which is partly true, but there's a little bit more context that really does need to be added to it. First of all, when Elphinstone finally decided to retreat in early January of 1842, he had an army of about 16,000, and we hear the 16,000-man army got, you know, decimated. Well, first of all, he didn't actually have 16,000 shooters. He had about 4,000 or 5,000 shooters, which consisted of British soldiers, uh, uh, foot soldiers, cavalrymen, in addition to a large amount of sepoys, Indian soldiers who were with the army of the Indus. Um, in addition, the rest of them were all camp followers, and this is what really, really screwed the army going through those passes to Jalalabad. Because the camp followers held the army up, and they provided targets, and they held the army down. Um, and that's what really, really got them. On the contrary, when General Pollock and General Knott, who came up from Kandahar and then from uh, Peshawar as well, when those two armies came in, and they were, Pollock's army was eventually known as the Army of Retribution because it just laid waste to everywhere it could in revenge for the entire British military just being extinguished in the passes to Jalalabad. Um, when those armies came through, they lacked camp followers and they left all that spare baggage behind. And they actually fought much better than Elphinstone's army when he was going through the passes. So it just goes to show that what really screwed Elphinstone going through the passes, well, one was the weather, which we'll get about into a second, but two was the fact that he had all this extra baggage. It was not a fully functioning military. It was a quarter shooters and then the rest of them were, you know, camp followers who just held them down. In addition, when it comes to actually fighting with the rifles, for the most part, the Afghans used a number of tactics. Shooting from behind rocks and hidden in encampments in the hills was just one of them. They also did stuff like put barriers up in the, in the, in the mountain passes, and they would do things like block the British, uh, create chokeholds, and then the British would get stuck at these chokeholds, and then they could easily shoot down on them, but more importantly, close with them. What the Afghans would often do is, you know, decimate some of the force from the hilltops and then move in as that force was more decimated and couldn't move and they would fix and hold and then move in and actually start the close in work with a lot of daggers and knives and stuff. Going back to the weather, the weather was an extremely important thing to consider here. Dead of winter, one of the worst winters a military could have endured. Um, the majority of Elphinstone's casualties were not from the Afghans. The majority was from the weather and the overexposure and the problems with just the snow. I mean, you read Lady Sale's journal. She talks about waking up in the morning from one of the tents and the entire tent is just surrounded with corpses of camp followers and, tra and stragglers who had nowhere to sleep but in the snow. So when they were sleeping in the snow, people would just die of overexposure. Something else about those armies from Pollock and, Con uh, from Pollock and Knott was that when they fought, they were at less of a disadvantage, not only because of the previously mentioned camp followers, the lack of them, but more importantly, they realized the advantage of the hills, and they would actually send foraging parties and actually pickets to go up on the hills and then fight the tribesmen from there, in addition to pushing on the valley floor. So they realized the problem that Elphinstone didn't realize at first. The thing is that even if Elphinstone had realized that that would have been a better tactic than just pushing through the valleys, he still, it, he would not have had the strength or the energy to push up to the mountaintops because just the winter was so horrible and the guys just could barely move every single morning. It must also be noted that when Akbar Khan's forces faced um, Pollock's and Knott's forces um, on a pitch battle in open terrain, it was no match at all. The Akbar Khan's forces would just be extinguished. In fact, multiple times they were, such as out of the, outside of Jalalabad when that happened. But let's also realize that even when Pollock was fighting a delay in action back from Kabul to Jalalabad and then Peshawar, um, he still faced a lot of the same problems that Elphinstone did in those tough mountain passes. And, and there are a number of Pollock's troops that were actually massacred in the same very passes that the retreating army was massacred in several months previously. 
So thanks so much, Miles, for letting me run that really interesting and informative video on a bit of history that I don't know anywhere near enough about, aside from what I've read from Flashman novels. So, uh, always a pleasure to have guests on here. And uh, if you haven't already done so, please like and subscribe to Bloke on the Ranger. Please uh, consider supporting us on Patreon, and we'll uh, hopefully keep moving forward for you. Bye.